last week, I laid out uh, two goals for this series during Lent. And the first one uh, was to give us some new handles for our own spiritual lives, some ways that we can go deeper in the faith. And then second, I said I wanted to use these same handles as a way of starting to think about ways in which we pass the faith on to the next generation. So it seems clear to me that if we're going to reach people who were born in the last 30 years or so, we need to rethink our approach. Not what we believe or what we preach, but our approach and what we emphasize and how we teach it and how we live it. So last week we talked about faith and how it connects with our understanding of the world around us, the understanding of creation and the environment. And this week we're talking about compassion. So let's take a moment, let's pray together. God, we thank you. We thank you for surrounding us with your great love. We thank you for the gift of the scriptures, for the gift of music, for the gift of worship, for the opportunity to come together. And we pray that you would surround us in these moments with your wisdom, with um, a spirit of understanding. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard recently about a United Methodist Church in Mobile, Alabama. One of their older members, um, her name is Irma, she finally had to go into a nursing home after many, many years of leadership in the church. And one of the things that she missed the most about it was the fact that she couldn't get out to worship on Sunday mornings. So when her birthday came around, some friends of hers in the church took up a collection and they booked an ambulance to come to the nursing home to pick her up and to bring her out for worship in the Sundays leading up to Christmas. And, you know, they raised enough money that they were able to do this not just once but twice. And for her, that was incredibly meaningful, just an incredibly gracious and meaningful thing for her church family to do for her. So compassion, this word, literally what it means is to feel with someone, to feel something with someone. So Irma's friends felt how much this was paining her not to be able to make it out to church. And they ministered out of that, feeling that with her, they ministered out of that and found a way to help her. I remember when I was a Boy Scout, you know, in the days before GPS, and um, one of the things that we had to learn for our orienteering merit badge, right, is how to use a compass. And so I remember walking around the streets of the town where I grew up, and it was, a, uh, it was kind of like a scavenger hunt. So you're going to go from this place to this place to this place, and you're going to follow this bearing, right? And, and you were supposed to figure all this out. It wasn't instruct, you weren't instructed based on... Um, you know, where to make turns, but it was about bearings. And I remember thinking how magical it was that you had this thing in your pocket that you could just pull out and it always pointed, you know, in the direction that you wanted it to go. And now, how amazing is it? I can pull out my phone and write, it directs me wherever I want to be. But still the phone, if you have ever looked at it, you know, at least my phone has a compass app which I find very interesting. We still have compass apps on our phone. To what end, I'm not really sure, or who actually uses them, I'm not sure. I know that there's probably not a definitive linkage between these words, compassion and compass, but it's interesting to note that compass is part of compassion. Compass probably has its own history that has something to do with stepping together. I think they come from different places. So the idea of walking off an area together as opposed to feeling together. But still I think that it's important and significant that the one is contained within the other, especially as it comes to our faith. Because I would argue that compassion is the compass of the Christian life. Compassion is our compass. So compassion in the New Testament is a deep emotion. In the ancient understanding, compassion wasn't a matter of the heart. It was really a matter of the gut. This was something that you felt here. 
And so the word that's used in Greek to describe um, how you feel it, I think that King James actually um, talks about Jesus being moved in his bowels, which sounds very odd, right? But the idea is it affected him so deeply. And that's kind of what's being described here. And Jesus, of all the people in the New Testament, is described most often as being moved with compassion. About a dozen times in the New Testament, this word is used to talk about how Jesus is feeling. Now, today's gospel lesson is not an easy lesson. Um, Had I stuck with my original plan and just talked about uh, the time that he spends healing people and then the fact that he has compassion on the crowds and he feeds them, then that's no problem. Jesus has compassion on the crowds who are traveling with him because they've been with him for three days. He's been teaching them, he's been healing them, and now he's afraid that if they don't get some food, some of them will fall over on their way home. So that should be an easy sermon. So care for people, have compassion. The middle part of the reading, of course, that describes the healing that he does is also a story of compassion. Jesus sees their needs and he meets them. There, Jesus most clearly allows compassion to be his compass. But the first part of this passage is different, isn't it? It's very different. Here, Jesus seems anything but compassionate. This is probably one of those passages that confounds people most of all when they read it. So this is a very famous passage because it is so confusing. He encounters this Canaanite woman. And we wonder, is this even Jesus, you know, the Jesus that we know? Who is this person who's talking with the Canaanite woman? Now, scholars say that probably the reason why he's traveling in this area, the area around Tyre and Sidon, is because uh, he's probably looking to get away. He... Tyre and Sidon are way up at the very northern edge. They're on the seashore. They're at the very northern edge of the region of Galilee. And so Jesus is probably looking to go a little bit outside of his own borders in order to get away from the people who have been following him. And then he runs into this woman. Now when she approaches and she asks for healing for her daughter... Jesus at first ignores her, which strikes us as being very surprising. Well, but meanwhile, the disciples are saying, Lord, send her away, right? She's driving us crazy. She keeps yelling at us to do something. What can we do? Finally, when she throws herself down on the ground and she begs Jesus for help, all Jesus says to her is, It's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Now, in the Middle East, to call somebody a dog is an insult. So now Jesus has not only ignored her, but he's also insulted her. But if you read back a little bit in the gospel, if there's an explanation at all, the thing that comes to mind is the fact that Jesus makes this same statement about who his mission is for back in Matthew chapter 10. When he sends out the disciples, he says, don't go anywhere among the Samaritans. Don't go into the homes of any Gentiles. Instead, focus on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so when he's confronted by this Canaanite woman, this is what he has in his mind. My mission is not to Canaanites. My mission is to not to people from Tyre and Sidon. My mission is to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so he says to her, basically, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. Right? I can't. You know, compassion is a hard thing. I had a professor one time um, tell, <laughs> tell me... <laughs> And she's a friend of mine, she's a wonderful person. Uh, She said to me, you know, I thought I was going to be a pastor too until I realized people were going to be coming to me all the time and telling me their problems. (laughs) 
And then I decided to study the Bible instead. I spent a summer doing a, an internship as a hospital chaplain. I learned a lot, and one of the things that I learned in that was, I just can't do this every day. There is no way I could ever be a hospital chaplain every day. Because compassion is just too hard. And I think that that's one of the reasons why Jesus so often goes off by himself. He goes out, off to pray, yes, but he goes off to recharge and to recover and to rebuild his ability to have compassion. For compassion to act as our compass, our hearts have to be soft enough and tender enough to be able to feel what someone else is feeling, to be able to feel with someone else. But after a while, all of us reach this place where we just are not that anymore, right? It just builds up to the place where we say, you know what, I can't, I can't do it anymore. So one of the books that I read to prepare for this series, and actually the, this structure of the series is based on, it's a book by a um, pretty well-known writer. His name is John Philip Newell. And the book is called The Rebirthing of God, Christianity's Struggle for New Beginnings. And in that book, he has a chapter on compassion. And one of the things that he describes, he describes compassion as an act of courage. And he says it takes actually three different dimensions of courage in order to practice compassion. He talks first about the courage to see, and then the courage to feel, and then the courage to act see and then to feel and then to act. So the seeing part, you know, it's easy for us to ignore suffering. We can turn off the TV, right, which is kind of our you know, preferred method. When something gets a little too overwhelming for us, we turn off the TV. We can, you know, stop listening and tune out. Even though somebody's telling us something, we can mentally just check out, right? We can walk past people on the street and just kind of avert our eyes. When we see something that somebody's posting on Facebook that's you know, somewhat distressing to us because it challenges our point of view or, it, or it's something that we say, wow, that's pretty intensely personal, um, we can scroll past it instead of engaging with it. Jesus just wanted to ignore that woman that was in front of him. The disciples wanted to ignore the woman who was in front of them. They say specifically, tell her to go away, right? We don't want to see her anymore. We don't want to hear her anymore. So there's this idea there that's very powerful, you know, that out of sight and out of mind. But then when the woman throws herself on the ground and she begins to plead her case, and even when Jesus insults her, she doesn't walk away and she doesn't give up. She continues to engage. She continues to challenge his perspective. Yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from under the master's table. I don't know exactly what happens in Jesus' thinking in that moment. But something shifts. Something breaks open. So he has this rule that he set for the ministry that says, no Gentiles, Jews only, right? He has this rule that he set. But in this moment, Jesus has this choice. What matters more? Is it going to be the rules that I've set? Or is it going to be the person who's right in front of me? Which makes more of a difference? I would argue that it, in probably 50% of the cases anyway, the thing that keeps us from actually following our compass of compassion are rules that we've set. As a church, as society, laws, right? There are laws on the books in, in cities where you can't feed the homeless where it's illegal to feed the homeless. We set these rules that keep us from being able to practice compassion. 
Do you remember when Pope Francis um, caused a big uproar because he said, uh, when interviewed and asked about how he'd deal with um, someone who was gay, if he was their confessor, when he asked the question, who am I to judge? I don't believe that what he was doing in that moment was necessarily um, trying to deny the church's stance on the issue. When he was asked to explain what he meant, he, he pointed first to something that he was taught in his catechism. He said, the first attribute of God is mercy. The first attribute of God is mercy. And so what I hear in that response is, there's another compass to follow here. There's another compass. So Jesus develops the courage to see, and he develops the courage to feel. And so now the question is, will he have the courage to act? Recently I watched the movie Selma. Have you ever seen that movie? It was made a couple years ago. It was about the, uh, the march from Selma to Montgomery in 1965 that led up to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And so one of the major themes of this movie is about how Martin Luther King and others who were leaders in the movement struggled with the fact that violence was all around them all the time. And as they pressed the struggle, people were being hurt and people were being killed. After the first attempt to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge in early March, after it ended with uh, police, state troopers, just brutally attacking a crowd of protesters, when these images were shown on the TV that night, and I'm sure that many of you remember it, this began to change people's minds about what needed to be done. So courage to see became courage to feel, became courage to act. Again, compassion is the compass of the Christian life. You know, I like this story from the scripture today because here we see how Jesus reconsidered his position after encountering someone who showed him that his compass was off, that it needed to be recalibrated. And so he healed the Canaanite woman's daughter and he blessed her. We have a whole generation today that's convinced that the church is so wedded to its positions on this issue or that issue that we've completely lost sight of people. So a generation ago, that defining issue was divorce, right? And as a result, how many people came into denominations like the United Methodist Church that took a more understanding position? I can't tell you how many people I've spoken with over the years said, I used to be this, I used to be that. But when I went through my divorce, I had that conversation so many times people came into denominations like the United Methodist Church in part because they saw that our compass was about compassion. Today, you know, the issues are different, but the need is still the same. The need for compassion. The opportunity is still the same. Opportunity to practice compassion. So if we can have the courage to see and to feel and then to act, if we can remember that even Jesus sometimes needed to have his, his compass recalibrated, then we can show a whole generation the wonders of God's love and God's mercy toward us. So let's go forth from this place to make compassion our compass. Amen.